Hello everyone, welcome to episode number 85 of Ask Concussion Doc. Um, we are obviously in the middle of this global pandemic, which is affecting so many things and so many people. Um, we have decided just to, for the next little bit, rather than pick a topic to talk about, we're just going to kind of go live and see what kind of questions come in. Uh, I put in my story for somebody to um, ask questions ahead of time. And so I had a couple questions come in that were interesting. So I'll use those ones to kick us off. So if you do have any questions, just type them in to the comment box below and um, I will answer those questions. For those of you listening on the podcast, I'm doing this live via Instagram as I usually do. Most of you that listen to the podcast don't realize that I'm actually doing this live on Instagram as I'm doing it. Um, but yeah, that's how we usually do it. We do it live on Instagram. And so every Wednesday at 1.30 uh, p.m. Um, is when we are answering live questions on Instagram. So for those of you listening or watching on YouTube and you wanna have your questions answered, feel free to write us or join us live at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time on Instagram. Okay, so the first question that I had that came in was regarding um, concussion prevention strategies. And for those that know me or have listened to me over the, uh, over the years, um, know that I talk about concussion prevention strategies um, quite a bit. Um, a lot of times people will ask us about different types of helmets or mouth guards or different protective equipment that you can utilize. And the question that came in today was actually asking about um, uh, vision training and neck strengthening. And so the idea behind vision training as a concussion prevention tool is that by training your eyes to be able to see more in the periphery, being able to respond better, potentially being able to either get out of the way of a collision that's about to occur, or at least be able to prepare yourself with enough time to um, uh, mitigate the impact that's about to take place. Now, in terms of neck strengthening, the idea behind this is that while your neck and your head are connected, concussion is your brain moving around inside your skull and it creates a stretching of your brain and this is related to how much acceleration or deceleration is involved. So if you can lower the amount of acceleration or deceleration to the brain, you can theoretically lower the risk for concussion. Now if you think about your body and your head as being two separate things, if I'm going to get hit directly into the head and my neck is loose, Therefore, when, when my head moves, it can move independently of my body. So that means there's a really small moment arm, which means if I get hit in my head and my neck is loose, my head can whip all over the place, which means the acceleration in my head is going to be higher. If I stiffen my neck and I couple it to the rest of my body, let's pretend my neck was a completely rigid device and it was completely st- fastened to my body so that now when I get hit in the head, the only way my head can move is if my entire body also moves with it. Well, there's a lot of weight down here. So for somebody to move my head with sufficient acceleration to cause a concussion, they would have to hit me multiple times harder than they would if my neck or head was loose. So the theory then became, and this has been, this has been studied for years, demonstrating that increasing the variable of neck stiffness results in a significant reduction in head acceleration and therefore a significant reduction in concussion risk. The problem is most people look at that and say, oh, neck stiffness, well, maybe we should be doing neck strengthening programs. But the problem here and where people kind of fall off is that neck strength and neck stiffness are actually two completely different things. Right? You don't think that NFL players have really strong necks. They get concussions all the time. Right? MMA fighters don't have really strong necks. They get concussions all the time. Rugby players don't have strong necks. They get concussions all the time as well. So just because your neck is strong doesn't mean that it's going to be stiff when you get hit. Right? If I have a really strong neck, I'm still going to have to keep my neck mobile as I'm playing my sport. If I know a hit's coming, well then I can stiffen my neck and get ready for it. 
So when studies first started being done on this and looking at the different variables, and one of the, one of the main studies that I quote all the time is a study by Viano and colleagues in 2007, and they made a finite element model where they looked at different variables, and they found that neck stiffness was the best way to reduce head acceleration by reconstructing various um, NFL impacts. They were able to show that by, by increasing the neck stiffness variable, you were able to reduce head acceleration. So now again, let's think about this logically. They found that the peak acceleration value happened in the first six to 20 milliseconds after the impact occurred, six to 20 milliseconds. Now, if you go and look at biomechanical research around the cervical spine, which is your neck, to activate or engage the muscles in your neck, to even initiate the contraction in the muscles of your neck takes 90 milliseconds, right? Concussion impact, your head reaches peak acceleration in the first six to 20 milliseconds. To contract the muscles in your neck, to even initiate the contraction takes 90 milliseconds. It takes another 150 milliseconds after that to get to half of the contractile strength in your neck. So that means even to get to half of the possible strength level in your neck, you're up to 90 plus 150 milliseconds. By the time you do that, the concussion has already happened, right? Six to 20 milliseconds for your head to hit peak acceleration, 50, or 90 plus 150 to even get to half of the contractile strength. Now, if you think about getting to full contractile strength, let's add another, let's say 100, 100 milliseconds on top of that. Well, you're now, you're, you're almost at half a second to get, to get that really strong neck to be stiff, right? So neck strength and neck stiffness are two separate things. So can neck strength be protective against concussion? The answer is yes, but only if you have sufficient warning that the impact is about to occur, right? You need a good, you know, almost half a second of warning ahead of time. But if you look at most concussions that happen, even if you're watching, you know, football or anything like that, you see the the defenseless receiver, you know, looking over their shoulder and they get flattened before they even know that the hit is going to happen. That's when next strength doesn't mean anything because you don't have enough time to contract the muscles in your neck to even have it matter at all. Most concussions happen when the person is unaware they're about to get hit. Because if they were aware they were about to get hit, they could contract their neck, stiffen up, get themselves in a ready position to reduce the amount of acceleration that happens inside the head. Um, or they could just get out of the way, right? If you have a half a second, you can make the decision to either bear down, put your head down and go for it, or you can make the decision to sidestep and avoid that altogether. So the answer is, should we be focusing on working on neck strength or should we be focusing on game awareness and your surroundings? And that's where vision training comes into play. So this person's question, which was quite insightful, asked, should vision therapy and neck strengthening be considered concussion prevention tools? When you look at vision training, there is actually some decent evidence to show that pre-season vision training can actually reduce concussion risk. Now the theory on that is, is, could be one of, one of many, but it could be that vision training opens up your visual field to give you more game awareness so that it allows you to get out of the way or know that a hit's about to happen and stiffen up with enough, you know, warning. Um, and that's, and that's really, it. I don't think it's, there's any other, there's any other reason. That's, I think the reason why vision training could be effective, but it has, it kind of goes in line with the whole idea behind neck stiffness. So neck strengthening programs by themselves have not been shown to reduce concussion risk. And I think the reason is because people are not aware the hit's coming. So if you paired neck strengthening with vision therapy, would that work better? Possibly because the vision therapy might give you enough warning to either A, stiffen your neck or B, get out of the way. Now I saw a question come in as I was going on about that. Oh, Juliana, what's up? What additional neck exercises can we do to help neck stiffness aside from tennis ball? Uh, one which I'm already doing, noticing adding added stiffness since treatment has been on hold. Um, in terms of in terms of neck 
stiffness as a rehab tool. That's not really what I'm talking about. What I was talking about there is as a prevention tool. Um, in terms of a rehab tool, you just want to focus on more um, uh, neuromuscular capability. So being able to know where your neck is in space. So like you don't want to just focus on straight up stiffness. You want to consider your neck to be um, a sensory organ. Your neck tells you a lot about where you are in space. If your neck is weak, it can also lead to tightness. So neck tightness and neck weakness go hand in hand, but neck tightness is not the same as neck stiffness. So in, as, in terms of a rehab strategy, you don't want to increase neck stiffness per se, but you do want to work on things like neck strength because neck strength will actually help to alleviate the tightness and the tension, which causes a lot of the um, the proprioceptive issues as well as a lot of the um, like the dizziness and, and visual sensory issues um, and a lot of the headaches. So typical strengthening protocols rely on working on what's called the deep neck flexors. So that's your typical chin tucks. Um, so pulling your chin back and then lifting your head up. So if you're lying supine on your back and um, you put a little towel underneath your head, so you fold it up so that it's, it's in fours, so it's you know about yay thick. You put your head on it so that it's just resting on, on this towel. You wanna tuck your chin so that you're actually giving yourself a double chin. You can't really see it because of my beard. I'm trying. You give yourself a double chin and then without letting your chin go, you lift your head slightly off the towel because you still want your hair to be touching the towel and you just lift slightly up like that and then you hold it because that's strengthening these muscles in here. Now these deep neck flexors, which are actually underneath your trachea, they're in behind your trachea. Because they lie flat on your, um, on your vertebrae, they are very proprioceptive. The, the closer a muscle is to your vertebrae, the more proprioceptive it is, the more it tells you about where you are in space. So that's why you wanna be working on those ones. If you have a lot of tension back here in the suboccipital region, those muscles are what cause a lot of the headaches and they cause a lot of the visual issues, the ocular motor side to side, the skipping that happens in people's eyes. Those muscles back here contribute a lot to that. These muscles in the front, if they're weak and dysfunctional, it makes these muscles back here tighter. So by working on these guys in the front, so like I said, you're lying on your back, face up, you tuck your chin down and you just slightly lift the back of your head off of the towel that's behind your head so that your hair and your head is still, you can still feel it there, but the weight of your head is being held. And you hold it for five seconds, and then you let it down back to rest for five seconds, then you lift it up for five seconds, then you put it down for five seconds, lift it up for five seconds, etc. You do that five times. As you get better at it, you wanna increase the amount of time you're able to hold for. So you go from five seconds up to seven seconds, up to 10 seconds, up to 15 seconds. The goal is to be able to do that for at least 30 seconds. So this is just an isometric strengthening protocol for the deep neck flexors. Um, another thing you can do then is work on your lateral side. So muscles like your scalenes, uh, your traps, those types of muscles on the side. So the same thing, you wanna lie down on your side uh, using the arm of a couch I find is good because you want your head to kind of be in a neutral position. So you're on your side and then you just lift up, unweight your head off of the, off the couch and you hold that for five seconds and then put it down up for five seconds, etc. So these are just isometric ways to strengthen the neck. That strengthening, as you do that over time, if that may flare your symptoms while you're doing it. If they do, that's probably more of a good sign because it shows that by aggravating or working those muscles in your neck, you're actually, um, you're actually affecting change, which shows in the symptoms that you're feeling. So if you do that and you start to feel somewhat symptomatic, if your headaches increase, if you feel a little bit more dizzy, that's probably a good sign that your neck is contributing to those. And by doing this more and more and more, you're going to affect change and reduce those symptoms that are coming from the neck. So that's one piece is the isometric strengthening. So you can do that on your back, on each side. You can also do it face down where you're just lifting back up like this and holding. So those, as you increase in time, you're gonna increase the strength Increasing the strength will help to reduce the stiffness and reduce the stiffness will help to uh, improve the ocular motor function of your eyes, reduce your headaches, reduce the sensation of dizziness. But another thing you want to do on top of that, you can't just rely on the strengthening, the isometric strengthening. You also want to work on your neuromuscular control, which is um, your, your proprioceptive feedback. So for example, there's a reflex 
called the vestibular ocular reflex, which is how your eyes coordinate with your inner ears. So if I turn, if I'm looking at, at something, so let's say I'm looking right here at the camera in front of me, and I turn my head to the right and I keep my eyes focused on that camera and I turn my head back and forth like this, I have a reflex that's happening as the fluid spins in my ears to tell me that my head is rotating. It, it sends a signal to the muscles of my eyes as a reflex, it's very, very fast, to keep my eyes focused on what they're focusing on. That's called the vestibular ocular reflex. So this is a very, very quick reflex and it allows your eyes to stay fixated on a target while your, where your body's moving in, in, in relation to gravity. Otherwise, if that reflex wasn't intact, everything in our visual field would be constantly moving up and down side to side as we moved about our environment. But our reflex system is very strong in which it keeps our eyes focused on a particular target as we turn our head side to side. The vestibular ocular reflex can be impaired following concussion, which can make things uh, blur across your vision as your head moves. Uh, it can give you the sensation that everything is jiggling within your visual field. Many people have this when they go out and walk and run and things like that. So the rehab for that is typically side to side and up and down. Um, and you gradually increase the amount of time that you can do that for and you, then the speed in which you can do that for. Um, that's a whole other topic. One other thing, getting back to the neck side of things, is that the, you have little sensors in the muscles and joints of your neck that tell you where you are in space. They also coordinate with your eyes, and that's called the cervical ocular reflex. This one is typically mitigated at slower speeds. So your vestibular ocular reflex is very quick. So as you turn quickly, it's more vestibular ocular reflex. But if you just focus on a target and turn your head really slow, so anyone watching right now, you can try this. Keep your eyes fixated on a target, turn your head really, really slow. You might notice that one side is harder to keep focus as you go. Like for me, when I turn this way, I find it harder to focus this way. Um, and that's just because these muscles on this side are a little bit tighter for me. So that right there is the cervical ocular reflex. So if you do this slowly side to side and you feel dizzy with that, that's probably more issues with the cervical spine than in terms of vestibular. So something you can do to help work on that is look at yourself in the mirror, focus right on your own eyes, and then just turn your head slowly side to side, back and forth, and then up and down same thing and if you do that every morning every night and throughout your day even just pick an object in the room uh, and just focus on it turn your head side to side up and down that will help to reduce the dizziness but also that's more neuromuscular control and you're working on range of motion at the same time which helps to reduce the tension in your neck which will help to reduce the headaches and everything else so um, I know a lot of you are at home right now and you're unable to get access to a clinic and stuff that's like why I'm trying to give some some more tips on that so just for those that were watching at the start, what I was talking about initially was neck stiffness um, as a, a potential preventative measure against concussion. And the current question that I was answering right now was talking about different neck exercises, which can help with to alleviate the symptoms of concussion. That was a long-winded answer. Do you have any advice for people with persistent symptoms after a year? What works? Go watch my previous podcast on this topic. I talk about this so extensively. There's so much stuff that works. Um, so do a little bit of homework. Check it out. Uh, dun, dun, dun. Do you know what causes tinnitus after concussion? Whoops. Do you know what causes tinnitus after concussion? Oh, what is that? I just found a little thing here. Cool. Um, do, sorry, <laughs> I got distracted. Do you know what causes tinnitus after concussion and what can make it go away? Uh, I talked about this one last week because somebody else asked the same question. It is a common question. I will cover it again. Uh, we don't know what causes tinnitus necessarily. There's a few potential reasons why it could be. Um, there's a condition called Meniere's disease, which is, is, is more rare and it typically, um, it comes on because your the, the little canals in your ear produce a fluid and that fluid is what stimulates little hair cells to tell you where you are in space, right? So when you turn your head, the fluid will spin in those canals and stimulate a little hair cells that will tell you that you're moving in a certain direction or, or you're spinning in a certain direction. Um, or there's some sort of inertia, meaning you've, you've, you've initiated movement or um, 
Yeah, so that's how your vestibular system works. So your the, the canals and stuff are making this fluid, but there's a feedback loop that tells um, the, the, the canal to stop making fluid. We have enough fluid, stop making fluid. Now in the condition of Meniere's disease, basic because the same thing happens with the stimulation of hair cells in your in, in the ear for the perception of sound. So you have semicircular canals in your ear that that detect movement. Those are the ones for your vestibular system. Then you also have the cochlea, which is for sound, and that has the same type of fluid within it. And the, the sound hits your eardrum, which stimulates a couple little bones, and that stimulates the fluid to vibrate through that canal and stimulate hair cells, depending on what frequency, and that's what allows you to hear. So in a condition called Meniere's disease, the mechanism that tells your system to stop producing fluid is kind of broken. So your system continues to produce fluid, so you get an overproduction of fluid, and that overproduction of fluid increases the pressure, and that gives the sensation of this constant ringing, but it can also uh, give you the sensation of dizziness and unsteadiness. Those two things go hand in hand. This is more rare. A lot of people get diagnosed with Meniere's disease, don't actually have Meniere's disease. That comes on in attacks, where you'll have attacks of vertigo, ringing, and all that stuff that'll happen for a period of time, and then it'll kind of dissipate, and then it'll come on again, and it'll keep doing that over time. That's Meniere's disease. That's not typical with concussion injuries. Concussion patients will often just have this low-level faint tinnitus that's pretty constant. It does kind of come and go, um, but it it is there more often than it's not. That we don't necessarily know why that happens. There's some theories that potentially maybe there was damage to, to the, 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 the various canals, maybe there was damage to the auditory nerve a little bit. Uh, there's a thing called the labyrinthine concussion, which is actually a concussion to the labyrinth of the ear, which is basically affecting your perception of sound um, and vestibular. So that's, that's a theory as well. Um, we don't really know. One area that I have found helpful that a lot of people don't examine is the, the relationship of the neck. So the upper part of the neck into your throat is where your eustachian tube is. So you have these little tubes called eustachian tubes that go from the, your throat basically right behind your tonsils in the back. There's a little opening that goes out to your ear. Okay. Now, Sometimes those get sealed off and the, there's, there's a buildup of pressure. So there's a pressure difference in there because that eustachian tube has been closed off. So you know when you're flying and, you, and you, you're going up and down um, and you're having changes in pressure in your ears and you can pop your ears like that and acclimatize the pressure. That's kind of what this is, right? Now if that's closed down, you have this differential in pressure. Sometimes that can create a ringing in the ears. So I have with some patients been able to open that up with, by working on their neck and have tinnitus completely dissipate. In other patients, I haven't been able to do that. So one thing you could look at doing is having, there's a technique where you can actually drain the eustachian tube. So you put your, the, the, the practitioner will, if somebody knows how to do this, some chiros will do it, osteopathy. Um, there's, a very, there's a whole variety of people that would do this, but basically you go into the mouth behind the tonsils and you put some pressure and try to open up the eustachian tube to create a drainage of anything that may be in there, or at least a pressure equalization. I've also had, like I said, effective results by just working on the muscles of the neck and working on the upper neck, adjusting the upper part of the neck um, with, with various um, types of treatment, and, and, and it goes away. Other times I've tried to do that, no dice. Patient still says, no, it's still there, it's still ringing. I, typically what I'll do is I'll refer them to like ENT, uh, which is like an ear, nose, and throat doctor, um, or um, have some, some auditory testing done. That's typically where I'll go with that, just to make sure that there's nothing being missed, um, and that the cause for their, you know, particular tinnitus may be um, is is more likely to be something benign than uh, than something else. So I would just I would go through the the process of investigation, rule out anything bad, and if it's and if everything is coming back negative, and you know all the findings are are, are con continuously negative, then I would look at things like chiropractic treatment, um, eustachian tube drainage anything that can possibly work. I mean, there's not a ton of scientific evidence for this type of stuff, but it's something that um, it can't hurt and it might help. So that's what I would say. <laughs> um, 
Do you believe enough is being made to protect rugby players or just athletes in general from concussion? What do you mean by being made? Like, do you mean equipment-wise? I'm not sure what you mean by that. So if you're still here, ask that question. Yes, this will be saved for Keisha. Uh, concussion was over a month ago. Just diagnosed the BPBV horizontal canal. That's easy. Um, whoever your clinician is should be able to, you could find YouTube videos on how to help that. Um, that's usually just a maneuver that you do. Um, and with BPBV, if it's in the horizontal canal, it just depends on which side it's on. But typically all you have to do is, is just slowly roll over. Um, cause the idea with BPBV for those that don't know is that there's, there's, crystals that have been dislodged. So inside your inner ear, there's a little house called the utricle. Uh, and inside there, there's there's crystals called uh, little otoliths. And then you have your your canals that come off of that. Now, what happens in BPBV is a little crystal gets dislodged out of that and it ends up somewhere in the canal. And so when you move in a particular position, usually it's people will, will roll over in bed and the crystal will come down and it will create this negative fluid wave which will stimulate the hair cells and give you the sensation that you're constantly moving so you'll feel like you're spinning the whole world your eyes will even show it They'll, your eyes will be flicking back and forth trying to catch the room because your vestibular system is telling your brain that you're spinning so your eyes are trying to figure out what's going on and so they're moving all over the place so it gives you the sensation that the entire room is spinning around you so BPBV stands for benign meaning because there's no uh, it's not like a bad thing it's not it's not harmful to you in any way it's benign um, it's paroxysmal and proximal or um, positional vertigo. So it's a positional thing that happens for a short period of time uh, and it's benign. And so when you roll over, the crystal stimulates the fluid. The fluid stimulates the little hair cells, gives you the sensation you're constantly moving. The whole thing you have to do is just turn in a certain position and in a gradual way. And if it's horizontal canal, there's a thing called the barbecue roll, which you essentially just, you start um, on your side, you roll onto your, um, is it on your back first, then onto your other side, then onto your stomach, then onto the side you started on. And in doing that, you're moving the crystal around the canal and back into the utricle. So literally in one treatment, it's it's got like a 90% effectiveness rate. So whoever diagnosed you with horizontal canal BPV should have been able to fix you that day. Um, if not, maybe the second or third visit. It's very, very treatable, very, very easy, uh, but it is scary. So uh, if you're worried about it, don't worry about it. You just gotta find somebody that can kind of guide you along how to do that. But even if you go to YouTube, there's probably some stuff on how to, how to do it. Um, the only problem is you gotta figure out where it is and depending on the nystagmus that you're having, which is the eye movement and the direction of it, that will dictate where you start and how you do it. So that's the only thing I can't really help you with. Uh, okay, so we're back to the rugby question now. So the rugby question was, do you believe enough is being made to protect rugby players or just, or just athletes in general from concussion? And I asked about if that was about equipment and he said protective gear, information being out, etc. So protective gear doesn't matter when it comes to concussion. So I would say that, you know, no. Helmets don't protect against concussion. There's nothing you can build to protect against concussion. And the reason is because concussion is the brain moving inside the skull. So you can wrap whatever you want around the outside of the head because it doesn't matter because if the head moves back and forth, the brain's moving inside of it. And so a concussion is going to happen. So I don't care about little headgears like those stupid soccer headbands that they're making now supposedly for concussion. Those don't work. And the reason is because the ball still hits your head and your head still does this and the brain inside still moves. So it doesn't matter from a protective equipment standpoint. So far, there's nothing that can prevent concussion uh, from a protective equipment standpoint. Now, in terms of things like tackling techniques, um, there's some evidence to suggest that appropriate tackling technique is potentially um, protective against concussion. There's other research to show that it's not. So jury's still out about that. I think really the issue is educating the players to understand what the, what the implications are for continuing to play. If players knew more about why they should be telling somebody they have a concussion and actually sitting out when they think they might have a concussion, if they understood what the ramifications were 
about you know behind going back into playing too soon i think that's really the biggest thing right you're never going to prevent concussions from happening you just have to intervene when they do happen so that people are doing the right things that's our best protective angle at this point in time aside from not playing sports at all which i think people are still going to do no matter what right people are still going to have a dream of being an mma fighter even though they know it's you know potentially you know fatal uh, if if they get hit wrong they're still going to do it people are still going to participate in these sports so aside from that our next best thing is trying to find protective equipment to, to work, but so far nothing does work. Um, but the next best thing after that, and what we can do right now, is provide proper education as to the ramifications of continuing to play with concussion, um, understanding why that might be harmful to you, and having a proper return to play process in place. I think that's really the big thing, is getting people out of the game when they have a concussion and then not letting them come back into harm's way until they're fully recovered from that. And I think that's where the big miss is right now because we're still relying on symptoms to make these decisions. Uh, and symptoms don't mean anything when it comes to when it comes to concussion. Um, people that have all their symptoms gone away can still have impairment that they, they don't even realize they have. Slowed reaction time, slowed, uh, off, they're off balance, their ocular motor speed is off. So many things from a functional standpoint that can show us that the person is still not recovered yet we're still relying on symptoms to make decisions. And I think that's really the biggest issue, uh, something that we could tackle right now. Uh, do you have any advice for people with jaw issues? Uh, yeah, so... Um, Night guards can be helpful, so a lot of times people will clench their jaw at night, so that can be helpful. Um, if it's a if it's an issue issue with the discs, you said there's an issue with the meniscus in the jaw, and it causes a scratching. Basically, that when you bite down, sometimes that can that can also pinch. Um, so getting some work done on the jaw. There's a lot of practitioners that work on TMJ, whether it's osteopaths, uh, chiropractors. There's a lot of people that do work. I do some work on TMJ issues, so it just depends on on uh, what's causing it and then trying to do some stuff to help it from a rehab standpoint and also things like night guards tend to be effective for that because if you're clenching all night you might not even know it but if you're clenching all night that's just aggravating the problem at night when you're sleeping and then you wake up the next day and it's worse and it's aggravated so sometimes having that in place will will give you a little bit of a break um, over the night and allow things to kind of settle down a little bit but yeah, I would find a chiro or an, osteop uh, an osteopath or somebody that can work on the TMJ um, and get that done. Lion's mane mushroom. Um, there isn't really much on lion's mane specifically for concussion, um, but that might be a question for Dr. Herkel. Dr. Herkel is... Um, He's the uh, naturopath that is on our advisory board. He makes all of our post-concussion syndrome diets. Um, uh, I know that he he would be the person to ask about that. So if you follow at Dr. Uh, Paul Herkel ND, um, I think that's what his Instagram handle is. Uh, check him out and then maybe ask him that question. He would know more about than I do. I'm looking at it specifically from a concussion standpoint. There's no evidence yet from a concussion standpoint, but I know lion's mane is uh, effective for a number of different things. So it, I think it, 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 it may have some place, uh, at least theoretically, but nothing's been actually studied on it, so I can't really comment on it. Okay. All right, I think that's it. Hey, Sam, what's going on? Uh, do you have any recommendations on how to explain or discuss concussions with an employer so that they can understand what you're dealing with, how to ensure back to work plan, especially during a time when most concussion clinics are closed and we can't get proper help? Um, that is a tough one. Um, it's, it's usually, it's, it's kind of difficult for the patient to explain anything to an employer. Um, it's usually better to have a health practitioner, you know, write a letter of some kind. Um, 
So what I would suggest is whoever was managing the case prior to um, prior to this, see if you can get in touch with them and have them kind of write a letter and, and a return to work plan. I mean, that's typically what I do for my patients. If they're in the process of getting back to work, I'll write a letter to the employer and or the insurance company and say, here's what we're finding, here's what's happening, this is why they're having these issues, this is what we're working on with them, this is what you know. I think the timeline is gonna be for them, and this is uh, likely when they'll be able to return fully. So I would say get the healthcare practitioner to write it because generally if it's employee talking to employer, uh, that's gonna fall on deaf ears. It's gonna be very hard for, for um, the employee to be able to relay to the employer what's going on, right? They may be able to have the human element and say, this is what's happening, this is how I feel. But having a medical professional kind of chime in and say, this is why they're unable to do what they need to do, and this is how I think we can phase them back into what they need to do. So I would, I would lean on your healthcare provider um, for that one. Biggest nerve stimulation without equipment, breathing, any other suggestions? I would say that would be the big one is the breathing. Um, is and that's because the vagus nerve uh, function is actually stimulated uh, partly by by the diaphragm. So um, working on diaphragmatic breathing, um, yeah, without equipment, you'd be you'd be basically relegated to to that, uh, and also just doing whatever you can to to reduce you know anxiety because that is going to affect that as well. So reducing anxiety, trying to stay as calm as you can, um, healthy eating, low in, low inflammation in your diet, and, uh, and then diaphragmatic breathing exercises would be your best way. Oh my god, a whole bunch just came in here. I haven't looked at this one in a while. Not much going on on this one. Okay. All right. Other questions, other questions. What is your opinion about medications such as amitriptyline? Um, I mean, it really depends. I think that there's a time and a place for some of the medications to work. I think that some people are too quick to, to prescribe it, and the side effects of a lot of these medications can create other issues. So... Um, I would I would explore other options before I would go to the medication route. Um, that's just my my thought on it. Um, but there is you know a definite place for for some meds and some patients. So it really depends on the case. Any thoughts on ocular training while recovering from a sports injury? I mean, are you talking about concussion specifically or? When I do an extra. When I do an exercise called stretching side bending for my neck, I feel pain on the side of my ear on the back as well as after in my ear. Does this indicate an ear problem? No, not usually. So uh, the question again is when I do an exercise, so it's a, it's a lateral, it seems like a lateral flexing exercise. So they're moving their neck to the side, stretching their neck. They feel pain on the side of their ear and then after they also feel it in their ear. Does this indicate an ear problem? The answer is likely not. Usually what this is is when you're stretching the muscles of your neck, the muscles in your neck can create what's called referred pain. So it's um, the most well-known example of referred pain is a heart attack. So when somebody's having a heart attack, they often will feel pain or report pain in their left arm. There's nothing wrong with their left arm, but why are they feeling pain there? It's because your brain is not very good at picking up where pain is coming from. So somebody having a heart attack, your brain might perceive that something over here is going wrong, but I don't know what it is. So now everything just starts to hurt and ache and some people feel it into their jaw and into their neck and into their shoulder or in their back, right? It's, it's when something is, is going wrong, your brain is not able to pinpoint the actual location of pain. So a lot of times people with issues in their neck will report pain in the head. So a lot of times patients with post-concussion headaches, they'll report pain in the forehead. It's not their forehead and it's not their brain. Your brain can't feel pain in itself. So this is something that always blows people's mind is, is that the brain does not have pain sensors inside it. So I could go and poke your brain and you wouldn't feel pain. You might have a change in function 
right? You can stimulate parts of the brain and create changes in function or perception or smells or things like that, but you can't create pain. So oftentimes when patients will have you know, headaches in the front of their head, they think it's their brain, but it's not. It's usually something going on with their, with their musculoskeletal system, which is usually the neck. So the two muscles back here, right at the base of your skull, when they get really sore, they refer pain into the forehead or even in the back of the head or even on the temples. These muscles here on the side of your neck refer pain into the jaw, into the ear, and up around the side of the head into the temple. So this muscle here, this big guy in the front called your sternocleidomastoid, your SCM, this muscle here refers pain into the face, into the ear, and right behind, right on the bone of the base of your skull, right back here called the mastoid process. So that's right behind your ear. So when you're stretching laterally like this, likely what you're doing is just kind of irritating those muscles, and then it, it makes, your, makes you feel like there's pain in your ear or behind your ear, but it's not actually an issue with your ear, it's an issue with your neck. And so the exercises you're doing in terms of stretching your neck um, are probably you know, doing that, um, but I, you know, I, don't know if, I don't think you'd be necessarily doing anything too harmful, but there's no way for me to know without assessing you myself. So I can't really give you a full recommendation whether to continue or stop. I think that would have to go through your, your healthcare provider. How long does it normally take the brain to heal from concussion? The brain, as far as we know, from the, from the, the stuff that happens right after concussion, like blood flow issues, um, um, the, the ATP deficit that happens, kind of the metabolic part of concussion is actually a very short duration thing. So within you know a couple months, that piece has kind of healed. The symptoms of concussion though, and here's where people get confused because they think if they're still having symptoms, it means that their brain is still damaged. But that's not usually what it is. Usually the symptoms of concussion look the same as the symptoms of a whole bunch of other things like neck issues, like muscle tension in the neck that causes headaches or dizziness or ocular motor issues or vestibular problems or even anxiety and stress can look a lot like concussion. So patients that are having symptoms doesn't mean that the brain is actually still healing or is still damaged, right? The actual injury of concussion is a very short duration piece, but the other symptoms that you may be experiencing, that can last for as long as it takes you to find the right type of treatment to go with your unique issue, right? Every concussion is kind of different. Some people may be more on the anxiety spectrum and they may benefit more from psychological intervention or medication. Some patients may be more on the neck issue and they need treatment of the neck and rehab. Some patients may have an ocular motor thing. They need to see an optometrist and work on you know, vision correction. So it just depends, right? So the question of how not long does it normally take the brain to heal from concussions, usually within a couple months, most of the physiologic stuff that's occurred, at least as far as we know, has recovered. It's the symptoms coming from all the other things that cause the ongoing issues, okay? Post-concussion syndrome and like that type of thing, persistent symptoms, is, is mostly attributed to things other than brain injury. It's other stuff happening for the most part. Is it possible to fully recover? Yes, I don't know, people keep asking me this question, but yes, it is very possible to fully recover. Um, it, it's, um, it's crazy to think otherwise, um, and I feel sorry for people that don't think otherwise because it is such a treatable thing if you're doing the right things, right? The, the, it, it sometimes is a long road, right? Sometimes there's a lot of things you have to do and it takes a long time but it is 100% recoverable. You just have to put in the work to do it. A lot of times people will try things for a certain amount of time and it won't work right away and they'll quit, but that's the wrong mentality to have on it. So yes, you can fully recover, um, fully, fully recover with no issues um, and it's entirely possible and is more likely than not. Yes, somebody commented neurooptometrist versus regular OD, and the answer would be yes. Okay, I think that's enough for today. Uh, thanks everyone for joining. Like I said, it is um, probably the way we're going to do this for the next little bit, just to be able to answer your questions, because I know a lot of people are outside of areas where they can get care at this time because of clinics being shut down. So I'll try to be here to answer questions and help people along while they are um, unable to get care. We are, like I said, in the process of launching a patient 
uh, course where patients can actually um, go on, go through modules. It's probably going to be about an eight, eight week course, but there's going to be a bunch of different things in there to allow you to um, um, kind of help yourself in the period of time that you have where you don't have access to uh, a clinic. Anyway, that's it for me. Thanks, everybody. Stay safe, stay healthy. Bye. Whoa, wait, 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 wait. Just one more thing before you go. This episode is brought to you by the Complete Concussion Management Clinical Network. Are you suffering from concussion symptoms that just aren't getting better? Maybe you're in the wrong place. Maybe you're seeing the wrong healthcare professional. Visit completeconcussion.com slash find dash a dash clinic to find all the local professionally trained concussion rehab individuals in your area. Each of our partnered clinics have gone through extensive training on concussion assessment, management, diagnosis, treatment, and rehabilitation. Uh, they're going to work with you to try and find the root cause of your symptoms and then develop a treatment plan and approach to help get rid of them. If you don't know what's driving the symptoms, you can't ever help or hope to fix them. CompleteConcussions.com slash find a clinic. They have a 98% patient satisfaction rating and have a higher net promoter score than Amazon, Apple, and Netflix. CompleteConcussions.com slash find a clinic. You will not regret it.